This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great conversation with Stephen Catlin. Stephen is a major player in the insurance market and he set up a business grew it internationally, ultimately sold it. And we hear about his story, journey, and all the different challenges he faced during that time. And why on earth he's decided to start it all over again uh, with his new business called Convex. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Then we're live. Stephen, thanks for coming in. Pleasure. It didn't take us too long, surprisingly. It was great. Be busy, ask somebody to do it quickly. Definitely, no, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, I appreciate you coming in. Um, and uh, yeah, really interested to hear about how your career all began and why you got into insurance and, and why you started your business. I think like many people in insurance, particularly in Lloyds, I got there by mistake. My father was a doctor. Uh, he wanted me to go into medicine. I didn't want to do that. One of the reasons was I thought he worked too hard, which is a complete <laughs> joke. So I agreed to go apply for dental school. Oh, okay. Which I did. So you went to, you went to university no, first? No, I didn't. No. Because I found my A-levels. Oh. I didn't do any work. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I got placed again in the second year and still didn't get in. So I thought, right, I better get a job. And I actually, at that stage in my life, had very little interest in academia. I've changed a lot over the years. Um, and I just couldn't see any point in going to a red brick university doing something I wasn't interested in. Yeah. So I thought, I'll go and get myself a job. And had many of your kind of peers at school gone to university at that time, or they also went to work? And Well, I landed up at a comprehensive school. I went to prep school, and then the money ran out. So I went to a comprehensive school. So it was a complete cross-section of society. So I would guess all my contemporaries went to university. I was about the only one that didn't. Right. Okay. Um, so that would probably be about 25% of the population of the school. And I met a guy through sailing who said, hey, we want to buy in the box at Lloyd's. <laughs> but I had no clue what that meant. Um, no idea whatsoever. I didn't know whether it was a bank or insurance or anything. So I did a bit of research and okay, fine. So I went for an interview. I got my hair cut off <laughs> with all my shoulders. I wore a bright blue suit, which you don't want to go up with wide lapels yeah. and a wing collar and a kipper tie. And the, the only pair of leather shoes I had were brown with stacked heels. I, I went in thinking I was conforming. <laughs> <laughs> how, was, how was everyone dressed then? Oh, it was p- pinstripe. Yeah. A lot of people were still wearing a stiff white collars, actually. All oh, right. Yeah. And they let you. And they let you through the door. <laughs> Just. <laughs> <laughs> and so you interviewed with uh, an insurance company. A lawyer's managing agency. Right. And I was told that I'd probably get offered about twelve fifty. So I got offered nine hundred. So a rang, year. Yeah. So I rang up and said I was led to believe I might earn a little bit more than that. Oh, sorry, old boy. Let's have a look at it. And they offered me nine fifty, and I took the job. <laughs> <laughs> and is it what you thought it would be like? No. But I didn't really know what it was going to be like. Lloyd's in those days was very much public school. Male, no women allowed in the room in those days when I started. Wow. It was amazing, wasn't it? It was like a jungle. It was a little bit like going back to prep school in some ways. We used to f- flick paper pellets at each other <laughs> and stuff like that. And this was early, early to mid-70s? 73, that 73. was. 73. October the 1st, 1973. What was it actually like working back in those days? In what sense? How do you mean by that? In terms of like the culture... The environment. Well, you called everybody sir. My boss, I called sir for the first seven years. Right. And then after a negotiation with a reinsurance broker, who was my age, or two of them my age, who were calling him Brian, his name, after I said, would you mind telling me, sir, if uh, under certain circumstances when we're <laughs> negotiating, would it be awfully rude of me to call you by your Christian name? <laughs> he, says, he says, I'll think about it. I'll sleep on it. So he came back the next morning and said, well, if you really think it's important, I guess you probably could do that. Three months later, I plucked up courage to call him Brian. <laughs> and that was quite typical of the time. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. It's changed quickly. Yeah. Well, my left is to 17, calls me Stephen. So <laughs> I actually make a point of saying to people, call me Stephen. I mean, some people say Mr. Catlin. Yeah. I've got some people, I'll say, my name's Stephen. Yes, Mr. Catlin. But by they and refuse love, to. Yeah, they just can't cope with it. It's a hierarchical thing. So. Right. But I actually, I think, I, I've never believed you gain respect by being called Mr. You gain respect by how you behave. Yes, definitely. Yeah. How long did you work there for before you decided you wanted to start your own uh, fat company? Well, I, I, I started there in 73, and we formed a new company in September 84, um, so that's 11 years, almost to the day, actually. I became deputy underwriter 
after about eight years there, okay. which was pretty unheard of because I jumped, yeah. jumped through everybody else in the firm. But I had been de facto deputy for a bit before that, and then I had to ask to have it formalised. So I said, yeah. look, you look to me if something goes wrong, but you haven't given me a empowerment to stop it going wrong. <laughs> oh, do you think so? And he came back and said, okay, it's done. Yeah. Did it the next day, actually, funny enough. But we were, the, the thing called divestment, in noise, which said a broker and an underwriter couldn't be owned by the same holding company. I okay. worked for what was originally Entity and Gibson Merchant Bank, their subsidiary called Anton Underwriting Agencies Limited. And at that stage, the bank decided when divestment came along that they sell the underwriting to the broking was more compatible with their business, even though we made a lot more money than the broking did. So there was a lot of movement because of the divestment act yeah. that came on the Lloyd Act. Um, and um, I reckoned that we were going to be bought by either Sturge or Merritt, and I didn't want to work for either. Right. I didn't fancy it at all, didn't like the culture or anything. And um, I was at the time the secretary of the Lloyd's Yacht Club, and okay. uh, Commodore ran an agency, and he said to me one day, why don't you come you have your own agency and come and work with us? So he owned 35%, I had 65%, I gave five to my mum and two. And then about two and a half years later, we did an MBO. So we had a paid up capital of £25,000, £25,000 subordinated loan from him, upon which we paid a commercial rate of interest, paid that off within the year. And then we paid them on a valuation of a million pounds to buy them out, which was overvalue right. by a bit, actually, but it meant that we were free. Amazing. Yeah. Crazy. What was the, what was the biggest challenge in those days? Well, like in any, I don't care what, Startup business it is wherever it is in whatever sector cash flow is, is king. So, you know, eighty five percent of all startups go under through lack of cash flow. Yeah. So you've got to be on top of that. I was lucky because in our old firm they set up a subsidiary company with a new syndicate, and I ended up taking responsibility for it. So I learned about cash flow at somebody else's expense. Yeah. So when I went in myself, I knew what I was walking into, and I would do deals with people and give them a discount on the premium to make certain the premium was paid to me within 15 days of inception. Yeah. Normal credit terms are 90. Okay. And I basically used that as my sort of um, way of keeping on top of the cash flow. But we had to um, borrow the money for the buyout. And I went to Barclays Bank, actually. I went in with cash flow projections and the whole nine yards, spreadsheets, all written by hand by me. Right. That's the only way I know how to do a spreadsheet. I've never learned how to do a spreadsheet or machine. I don't think I use that. Uh, it's funny, I've, I, I, I mostly use my iPad and stuff now. Yeah. I need to get back on the pencil. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I spent an hour and a half with them. Yeah. And he said, well, there's some questions you're going to have to go away and look at. I said, well, fine, ask them. And I could answer every single question on the spot. Partly really? because I'd done the spreadsheet by hand. So I knew the derivation of every single number on that spreadsheet. And I went to lunch with a mate of mine, four o'clock in the afternoon. I had a letter on my desk with a £250,000 overdraft, unsecured, two and a half above base. Wow. Can you imagine that happening today? Absolutely impossible. It takes about two months just to get an appointment yeah, with the yeah. bank now. And then the other 100 came, two of my colleagues, I said, you get the loan on the back of your house and I'll increase your salary to cover the interest cost. But the capital is up to you, down to you. Right. So that's how we raised 350. Corporate lab overdraft went up to about 500 before we got it back down again. It's quite stressful, that is, I can tell you. Yeah, I can imagine, like, owing, owing money, yes. making, the, making the payments, starting yeah. the business. Yeah. Yeah. At what point did it then start to really, like, kind of turn and become profitable? And We made money at a syndicate level from the get-go, even in the first year. In those days, you could buy a lot of reinsurance or you could arbitrage. So I, I was basically playing an arbitrage game. Right. You can't do that today, and probably as well, actually. Um, well, at a corporate level, it took us about, I'm trying to think now, probably about five years. The first major thing we did was, was 10 years, and that's when we raised our first capital raise. And that's when I lost control of the business um, in terms of percentage holding. Yeah. It took 18 months to raise £21 million pounds in the first year, nine in the second. I mean, so that's a long time. Wow. But one of the things I've learned, actually, is... Funnily enough, the less you want to raise, almost the longer it takes. Yeah. The last big raise I did um, at Catlin was when we bought Wellington, which was then in 2006. And I went over to New York in January to do a Tier 1 Preferred, which is basically, it's nearly capital. Yeah. And it's, it's, about, it's under the cost of capital too, because it was risk-free rate plus 3.5%, I think it was. So that was about 7.25% in those days. Right. In perpetuity with a 10, what, 100%, 100 basis point uplift after 
10 years. And I went out thinking I'd get 300 million, um, and then I'd go to Europe and get the other 300. And it was, it was a time when there was a lot of cash in people's back pockets, there was nothing to do. And after about half a day, I think, mm, maybe we can get 600 here. Half a day? Yeah, just by watching it. So Amazing. at the end of the second day, we had a dinner, and one of the bankers said to me, you need to wind these guys up. And I said, OK. So there were two banks involved. They were both uh, 40-year-olds, Italian-Americans, competitive as hell with each other, but godparents to each other's children. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I said to them, I said, look, just so we understand each other, if we don't raise $300 million, ultimately that's my risk. I'm the one who's running the risk. And if we don't raise $600 million, if thought we try, that's also my risk. And by the, w- the way, the word wimp comes to mind. <laughs> So they got all wound up. Then on the Wednesday morning, about mid-morning, I rang up both trading floors and said, could I please speak to Mr. Wimp? <laughs> <laughs> Which went flying around both floors, and the, the, the testosterone was even higher. And by the end, of, by, by, I think we went to market at about, it may be midday or four o'clock, I can't now remember. We were covered to the, to the tune of $5.85 billion for $600 million. What? And I went home to my wife, and I said, there's something terribly wrong, because we should not be able to raise that kind of money at that price. No covenants at all. Nothing? Nothing. And the cash was in my bank account within 10 working days of the Monday. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> but that was interesting enough. That was um, January 2007. And I said, that's when I said to my wife, something's going to go wrong here. And sure enough, later on that year, then we... They- had the crisis. The crisis. Unbelievable. How, what was it like so, to going from getting the overdraft and you know managing the finances carefully, which I'm sure you did the whole way through, to running a big international business? Because you know, a, a lot of founders, they, they often find it hard to let go, to delegate and all of those things. Yeah, I think that's true, actually. I also think a lot of founders are not interested really in running the business. They just want to create a concept. I had always wanted to run a business, actually. Uh, more than I actually realised. But to put the thing in context, at 9-11, we were writing $430 million worth of premium and we had 92 employees. When we sold, which was, well, five years ago, 2015, we had 2,500 employees and we had a top line of $6 billion. So it had been, that the period between 9-11 and then had been the period where we had huge growth. Yeah. At that stage, we only had one office in London, that was it. Right. At the time we sold we had 57 offices in 22 countries wow and the evolution of the infrastructure that you have to build with that kind of growth going on is monumental and clearly i didn't do it on my own and people say you've done terribly well so and i said well actually that's kind of you to say that but actually we've done terribly well it's a team effort yeah oh, they couldn't have done it without you i said well maybe i will admit to being the team leader but i won't accept any more accolade than that because the reality of it is you can only do that with a really good, strong team of people, yeah. with different skill sets working together. Um, many of those people still work with us. So they've, they've rejoined you. Yeah, and yeah. Amazing. We can talk about that in a little bit. Mm. Did you have um, support as, as you were going through that growth phase? So any kind of mentors or anyone you kind of looked to for, for advice? I was woefully lacking mentors. I had been since school because I went to a brand new conference school and with the top year all the way through. So I, I kind of lived my life for quite a long time without the benefit of being mentored, which I look back on and think, well, how did I get away with that? I, was, I regret it, actually. I was fortunate near the end. The last two chairmen we had were absolutely brilliant, uh, Sir Graham Hearn and John Barton. Sir Graham Hearn was uh, chairman and CEO of Enterprise Oil. John Barton, more recently, was chairman of Next and also EasyJet. Um, yeah. And they were very seasoned, experienced people. They had very different personalities, but they were quite capable of pulling up short and saying, oh, Catelyn, you haven't got that right. And I think in some ways that was the best time because I did feel then that it was somebody being my minder yeah. who was genuinely trying to help me do the right thing yeah. and wasn't scared to tell me when they thought I was doing the wrong thing. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, there's a lot on, on mentorship at the moment. I think with young people, it's really useful to have someone to, to advise and guide. And Yeah, I mean, we now... And we did at Catlin actually um, put quite a lot of effort into mentoring actually, partly because of my experience when I hadn't had it and I yeah. realised the loss. I mean, I was the oldest person in the company for the first <laughs> 10 years and I started at 30. Oh, yeah, the li- yeah young, young bunch. Yeah, oh, a bunch of kids. <laughs> I think it's great. It's great to speak to people that have been through some things 
uh, or from a slightly different perspective, because perspective is, is everything. Yeah. And uh, I think it's really useful. It's good to see more people doing, doing work around that. Yeah. How, how do you find that the culture in the city has changed since you started to now? It's changed quite a lot, by and large for the better. The fact that there were any women in Lloyd's in 73 is just, you just can't contemplate that now today. Just, they weren't allowed at all? No, they were bad. Uh, I think they were let in in about 1975, <laughs> and the, the men couldn't handle it. It was. Well, there was, a, there was a backlash to. Well, no, you just sort of look at them, they were just gawking at the girls. <laughs> right. It's unbelievable. I think, uh, obviously, regulations increased hugely. Yeah. Transparency and accountability has increased hugely. Uh, I think the level of integrity and the disciplines have increased a lot. Um, the use of technology has obviously hugely increased in the last 15 years. I think we're in a better environment. There's work to do on diversity without any question at all. But Rome wasn't built on a day on these things and it has to be worked through carefully. I don't agree with quotas. I do agree with meritocracy. And I do absolutely agree with the equality of opportunity. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that was lacking in the city without doubt when I started. Has it changed a lot since then? Do it's you find changed, now that you can... It's changed a lot, but there's still work to do, in my yeah. view. And in terms of attracting young young talent, because the, in, the insurance industry has always had a problem attracting like the best, brightest, most innovative. Um, and maybe partly due to the lack of marketing at universities or at schools and so forth. Yeah, I don't actually agree with that. A lot of people say that, and a lot of people didn't really try hard. We did a graduate trainee scheme... Uh, for the last 15 years at Catlin. We had about, ooh, I can't remember now, we started 10 entrants and we got up to about 30 by the end. At the, time, at the level of 30, we had 10,000 applications for 30 positions. So it's actually not quite true to say you can't get talent. But if you don't make the effort to get it, yeah. you won't get it. It is true to say that people don't think of insurance as being the first port of call, as you said earlier on before we started talking, so few people actually understand what insurance is, what it does, how it works. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, though, the insurance industry, the wholesale industry, I'm not talking about personal life, but yeah. the big stuff which is what we do, it's an extraordinary market where it's still face-to-face. -face. Um, it's a friendly market. You can be friends with your competitors in insurance. You don't see that in banks, for example. So um, I think when people get in they suddenly realise, gosh, this is great. I mean, you don't, you're not having to work the hugely unsocial hours as a youngster that you do in banking or accountancy or law. You know, when you get more of an M&A and you're working all out of God's head. Yeah. yeah, I've done that four or five times in my life, and it's a finite period of time while you're doing a transaction. Yeah. But, you know, people doing transactions the whole day long do get burnt out very quickly, and only about 10% survive, actually, the whole process, which is... Says it all, yeah. doesn't it? You you won't find many people in insurance who say they don't like it. You will find many. Most people say, actually, I really enjoy it. A lot this. of people love it. I think the issue the issue often I find is you speak to young young grads, people at school, and unless they've had a family member that's right. worked in insurance, and you say Lloyd's, they always oh. think Lloyd's Bank, yeah, not right. Lloyd's of London. Absolutely right. And then you tend to find that um, graduates want to work for the sexiest industries with the biggest problems to solve. And I think insurance has big problems to solve. It's key to the economy and all of those things. But often the, the perception isn't like you're going to go work for Google. One of the problems with the industry, and it's been there all the time I've been in it, is that we're very bad at the industry of selling our value proposition. We're bad at selling it to governments. We're bad at selling it to businesses, to the man on the street. And de facto, almost we're bad at selling it to potential employees. Part of the reason for writing that book, actually, was to try and demystify insurance and speak in plain English so somebody could get their minds around it um, and find out what it is. And, and so many people who get involved. I know lots of people who join the industry, often from one of the other professions, say in their 40s, who say, gosh, I wish I'd known, I wish I'd done this for longer. And there's a, I can, I won't, but I can lift a whole ton of people in, in that position. It's a great industry, once you're in. I yeah. just, I think then, I just think more can be done. Um, and as time goes on, I can more be, is I being completely done. agree with you. Yeah. I'm a, I've, I have made speeches on some applications. We've got to learn to stand our value proposition. Yeah, yeah. Because they do add value. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the societal value is added by insurance. It's huge. Yeah. And how many people know that? Maybe no. five percent of the population. Probably yeah. near one actually. Yeah, no, it's true. And what do you think of the the recent articles in Bloomberg and you know again touching on culture again? 
Is it still is it still as bad as it's been portrayed, or has it got better now? Well, really interesting. I lunched yesterday with the female insurance journalist. I asked her the same question, right. rather than he, she asking me, because I'm trying to understand actually what is going on. I think the source of that article was fairly vindictive, as it happens, and I don't think it's reflective across the board. I certainly don't think the insurance industry was anywhere outside any, any kind of banking behaviour that was going on in those back years. Some of that. Um, behaviour was clearly egregious and she wasn't allowed to happen yeah. and I, I asked her the question because I first said I, have you spoken to people where you think that's the case and she says yes women often they bottle out of having it reported at the last minute for family reasons or for job reasons or whatever and you can see why that happens but yeah. in a sense it's a shame so I said to her have you ever ever had somebody from Catlin she said don't be it's ridiculous I think the thing is if, you, if it's not going in your own business and we have a zero tolerance um, and always have I, I have one regret actually when I caught somebody doing something I gave them a warning and I should have let them go and I wanted to actually but my management team was with me otherwise and I, actually I regret that now it's yeah like, it was probably 15, 20 years ago. Today, I wouldn't even think about it. That would be out. I think some of the older, uh, more chauvinistic big companies probably have a bigger problem than some of the smaller, younger companies because you know we've always not been part of it, so it's, it's a good place to be. Yeah, definitely. But if, if it's crept in over the years, I think I think some companies are finding it hard to eradicate it. It needs to be eradicated. I, I think it's an issue... I don't think it's commonplace as it was portrayed. It's definitely there, in part, but I think it's a small part. It's certainly not the majority. Yeah. Do you think it's gone down also with the, I'd say the alcohol consumption has gone down, but it feels like a lot of people now in the city are drinking less, certainly at lunchtimes. Um, they're often they're thinking more about their health and fitness and well-being. Yeah, I think attitudes to drink have alcohol have changed over the years. I mean, frankly, when I was building a reinsurance account with my old firm, and then they... Uh, if I didn't have a drink at lunchtime, I was, I was out, you know. Really? You had to have a drink? Oh, yeah, yeah. And not just one. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, work it out at the end of the week. And then working the afternoon is such a pain. So that was the kind of like almost peer pressure yeah. that you had to go out and yeah. have a long lunch and a drink. So I decided wine. when we set up Cap in 84 that I would only drink wine at lunchtime. And I would limit it to hopefully half a glass of wine. And I did that for about six months. Then I stopped completely. I'd have a glass of wine poured, but I never, I'd pick it up, do cheer, put it, it, put it straight down. Drink. And I found in the next six months, I got caught doing that once. Oh, they called you up on it? Yeah, <laughs> but only once. Um, and after that, I thought, I'm, still, I'm just not going to drink at all. I didn't. Uh, so now for, I've never said to you, you can't drink at lunchtime. I have said, if you have had a bit to drink more than you should, go home. Yeah. Don't come back to work. And I don't expect you to do it every day. Actually, there are pockets of drinking that still go on in certain areas of the insurance sector. Yeah. Rather than likely, there are pockets of drinking that go on in, banking, in certain parts of the banking sector. But it's a lot less than it used to be. And I think it leads to... I mean, a lot of bad things happen because of drink. Yeah. I'm not just talking... Um, so underwriting bad risks exactly and right. bad behaviour yes. and, yeah. and yeah. those yeah. things. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. And I mean, some companies... I think Lloyd's, have, Lloyd's of London have banned drinking uh, during the day. They have for the corporation staff. Yeah, for the corporation yeah. staff. I personally wouldn't do that. I think if you treat a person like a child, they behave like a child. If you treat them like an adult, most likely they behave like an adult. That's true. And you just set set standards yeah. and say, look, this is what we and then lift to the standards. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. How did you feel? So just finishing your journey. So um, you sold to Excel. Yeah. Then it all got sold to Axa. Yeah. How, how did you feel about selling the company that you created? I actually found that emotionally much more difficult than I thought. I thought I had my ducks in a row and self sorted out. I was quite clear in my own mind as to why we should do it. As with the board, it was in the interest of our shareholders as a public company. Um, it was the right thing. We did, did our, our shareholders proud. And as I'd actually included a very large percentage of employees with shares, they did well too. Brilliant. So everybody got looked after in whatever shape or form they were. And I went through sort of stages of emotion actually the, the emotion when it got announced emails coming in flooding in and then when we actually closed the traction another wave uh, of emails came in I was actually in Bermuda uh, and after I got to the 47th one <laughs> I was in tears I just couldn't I had to sit back at the house for two hours just to get myself back together again it was that bad wow. and then when I actually stepped down uh, which is in May 2017, 
I had another wave of emails and uh, I did stay on to actually um, help. We were sponsoring the America's Cup in Bermuda. So I spent that month really doing that. My wife came out, I think, the third weekend and she said to me, are you OK? So I said, no, I'm not, actually, but I will be. The truthful part of that answer was the first bit. The second bit was aspirational. And it's the first time in my life that I've actually experienced any form of meaningful depression, or whatever you want to call it. I'm talking to you about it now, but I've realised, actually, it is helpful to explain that it's quite normal for these things to happen. But Absolutely. I actually slid down till the end of September and called my way back up again uh, by the end of December, but it was a difficult time. I didn't get outside help. I probably should have done, but I didn't. I just said, I'm going to sort this. But no, the... And how did you identify what you were going through? The mojo has gone completely. Right. And you, yeah. you, you're thinking negatively the whole time. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like giving, as my wife said, it's giving, like giving up a baby. Um, yeah. So it was difficult. I stayed for two years before I stepped down out of a duty of care, actually, to um, really to my staff, to the shareholders, yeah. to clients' distribution. It got more and more difficult during that two years, but I'm glad, looking back, I'm glad I did it. I did the right thing. I knew day one that what I thought I was going to be doing, I wasn't going to be doing. So I had to cope with that as well. Oh, it's in the, in the new yeah. uniform. Then, you know, if you're taking over, you're taking over. Yeah. And you have to accept that. Yeah. Whatever said you'll be on the way through, you're taking over. <laughs> right. um, and, and, and even though you know that's going to happen, or you, blink, you think it might happen, actually when it happens, it's quite tough. And I've spoken to a number of people in my situation, and I don't know anybody who hasn't suffered the same emotional type reaction. Or how, how they cope with it is down to the individual yeah. personality. Yeah. But it is tough. How did you, uh, like, what did you do to, to kind of pull yourself out of it? And um, well, the first thing you would do is get on the front foot in anything you were doing, both work-wise and socially. I actually, during that six months, was not doing, that's probably the least amount of work I've done since 1973, I think. But even then, I still had things going on. And somebody said, I thought you were stopping working. I said, well, I am. They said, well, no, you're not. Um, and I, I did, I had lots of things to do within the industry. I, I was involved in other things like philanthropy and stuff like that. So I, yeah. I, I always had enough to keep my brain going. It was then really when we started thinking about, well, what next? Paul Brandt, who was my number two, was my number two. He was nine years younger than me. It must be now three years ago or so. We were having a beer one evening, and one of us, company which once said it now wouldn't be fun to work together again <laughs> it was almost a de facto statement yeah and, and, we, uh, and we moved on we didn't go any further than that it was just a recognition and we started talking in life I've been very fortunate and Paul's been very fortunate because twice in our careers the stars have become aligned once we should post 9-11 when we raised 500 million equity which nobody else does in the London market at that stage we were half the size of the big syndicates right within two and a half years we caught up and then we bought Wellington with the largest noise syndicate all the way through thereafter yeah um, and it was a combination of circumstances that allowed that to happen had we done some good foundational work I, I think we had but did we get on the front foot and go for it take the opportunity yeah we did yeah and it paid off and this time round, um, again string a set of circumstances I mean I had no idea that actually we were going to buy um, XL and that happened in a year or two right it, uh, happened when did that happen 2018, I think. Right, it's no, right. a very no, quick no, 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 before then. May 2016, maybe. 16 or 17. And it was a fantastic deal for the Excel shareholders with a ma massive cash transaction. Yeah. Um, one of the effects of that acquisition was London started to go downhill. And largely, this is a cultural difference between America and the UK. And uh, our American owners just didn't understand how different. London is, and particularly in Shorts, where it's far more relationship than anywhere yeah. else in the world. So a lot of my ex-colleagues were moving on. But what I hadn't realised was that when Axel bought XL Catlin, that released me. I couldn't have competed against XL Catlin because of the names on the door. I just, I just couldn't bring myself... I was allowed to contractually, sure. yeah. but I couldn't do it emotionally or morally. Um, I, I got the call on Sunday morning about 10 o'clock, after lunch, my wife said to me, Sunday lunch, she said, I detect a bounce in the air. <laughs> and I looked at her, because I actually hadn't joined up the dots. And I thought of it, I said, yeah, you're right. She said, well, what is it? I said, I've just got my get out of jail card for free. 
and that's how that felt. And I, Amazing. It, yeah. it, I didn't realise it was like having an eighty pound rock team on your back, which I didn't even know I was carrying. So that freed me up, and then other things happened, like Lloyd's losses. Yeah. You know, that year, every single product line in Lloyd's lost money, bar energy, and that was luck. <laughs> then two days later, and this um, is twenty eighteen. 2019? 18. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. And um, that's when Amazon made their £500 million loss. That came out two days later. And th- both those two things happened the all event, immediately after the announcement of AXA. And a lot of people were saying to me and to uh, Brando, either collectively or indi- indi- individually, you know, get back in the market and needs lead- leadership. But when some, one person says to you, just, you just put in the back of your brain. Yeah. And you look two or three if in the back of your brain. When it gets to about ten, you say, well, maybe and they're, and they're from different parts of the market. You right. Say, well, maybe, maybe we should think about this seriously. We did, and uh, I rang Brando up and said, "Do you think we ought to have a chat?" He said, "Yes." I said, "When?" He said, "Now." <laughs> so we had a conversation. The Friday. I said, "Look, let's not talk over the weekend. Let's think about it independently. Talk again on Monday." On Monday, we decided to go for it, and on the Tuesday, I rang up the banker who'd been telling me we should do it anyway, and said, okay, you're right, I'm wrong, let's see what we can do. Wow. And how long did it take you to raise the money this time? Amazing, really. We started, had some preliminary conversations in the June. We, we started in earnest raising the money right at the end of September, uh, and we had the money raised by, we were up and running 1st of May, it says 10 months. Nice. For, for, for $1.7 billion. Yeah, it's I mean, not it's an it's insignificant it's amount of money. No. And, and it, had you asked me before whether we could do that, I said, don't be silly. <laughs> not a chance. Yeah. And why? Did, and it's called Convex. Yeah. And what, or how, or how did that come about? <laughs> That's a good question. It obviously couldn't be called Catlin, because I, I have known my name for years. <laughs> you know, when people buy your company, your name's on the door, you've lost ownership of your name, actually. Yeah. Um, so we couldn't use it. And indeed, we didn't, I think others did want to use it. I wasn't that keen. I, I thought it's time to move on from there. But funny enough, having start, starting with C gives a link. Yeah. We did want two syllables, and we wanted something which is easy to say in succinct. Um, and Paul came up with Convex as a, as a pro ten. Right. We then wasted hours and hours and hours trying to find a name <laughs> and decided, well, by that stage, it, it'd been, it'd been new it was Convex, so we'd done some branding without even realising it. So it stayed. Perfect. Um, Do you think the challenges now are going to be the same you've gone through already? Or are we looking at a completely different um, market environment and, and so forth? It's different for a number of reasons. We're starting with that we had 130 people on board by the end of this year. There's another 30 in the pipeline. Right. So if you go back to what I said about 9 we only had 92 people. That was after, what, 15 years of building the business. So to start... It's ramped up is, quick. Is, is very different. The one thing that we have learned, which I think we knew, but I say this to anybody, reputation, relationships and trust built up over years has got the most enormous value and it's humbling to experience that actually. Uh, and it manifests itself in a whole ton of different ways. 75% of our employees approached us for a job, which is a pretty it's interesting statistic. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, we've used a headhunter for one role alone. Picking up from where we left off with relationships has been easy. We didn't make much noise about it, but at the end, of before we sold to Excel, Catlin wrote, sorry, led half of the business it wrote in, in Lloyd's. And that by a country mile was bigger than anybody else. And those leadership... Um, so that the main the main insurer? Yeah, yeah. well, the last, when it's syndicated bank, you know, the lead bank, yeah. lead insurer, this is the person who sets the terms, has a relationship with the client and the distribution. We kept those leads over time, we got trusted. And people therefore know us, and people want to be business with us again. And it, so, in terms of the, I always said it's not, this is not a startup actually; it's a greenfield. But it, yeah. and I think that's fair because it's hardly a startup when you bring culture, reputation, trust, yeah. distribution, relationships, staff with you. Yeah. Um, and you, therefore, you're in a very it's much less risky than when we started cap I tell you. Yeah. Starting with two people and nothing, that was much, much must more also, frightening. It must also be great now starting a business of this size with no legacy, no old systems, you know, you can build it culturally, you know, how you want and all of those things. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful privilege and we're again humbled by that. Um, 
to have a blank sheet of paper, to have no legacy of liability, to have no legacy of process is just magic. I've had a number of people come up to me, you know, competing to the and just say, oh, I wish I had that. <laughs> and one person I've explained it to who said, you have to stop talking now. He's halfway through explaining it. I said, why is that? He said, you're making me envious. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, we are blessed from that point yeah. of view. It has its challenges, though, because, you, you know, you've still got to work out, set up new systems, uh, you've got to make use of new technology, all that stuff. We're helped as it happens by, you know, there's any tailwinds in the market now, not headwinds. Yeah. Um, and there is going to be some, a lot of people have got a lot of tail on, the, on their books they'd rather not have. Yeah. So, you know, it does give us a fantastic opportunity. And having no legacy of process also means it's easier to use, get better use of technology quickly. Yes, 100%. So, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And you're focusing on that heavily. Yeah. One thing, interesting thing I noticed when I went to your office a few weeks ago was how people were dressed. Going back to, uh, you know, your first, uh, how you described your first boss, um, I was surprised to see people in jeans, T-shirts. Uh, it was quite quite interesting. It, yeah, it's... it's uh, when we were in sort of before we actually raised the capital, we had we had a WeWork office, All right. and everybody wear jeans and t-shirts there. Yeah. I hated it personally. I had a bit of office in Lombard Street, um, so it was pretty casual before we got going. As you can see, I'm wearing a suit and tie, and I always do when I'm in the city. I've done it all my life. Yeah. But I can't help it. <laughs> I, I kind of feel undressed if I'm not wearing a suit and tie. I've got a suit but no tie today. Yeah, <laughs> um, by and large, outward facing do wear suits and ties, and certainly if they don't see clients. Although, you see the clients have... Yeah, absolutely. And my thing is, when in room, room, do what room does. But it's easy to go into um, an office and take your tie off, than to go into an office and put your tie on. True. So I don't mind down dressing if it makes somebody else feel comfortable. Yeah. But I always start where I am. That's my age. And then in the office you don't mind what? If you're going to wear jeans, they've got to be smart jeans. Yeah. And we don't want people going around in flip flops and things like that. And yeah. generally speaking, you don't see people in t shirts. You might see them in a bit of normally a collared shirt of some description. Yeah. But we haven't laid down hard and fast rules. We essentially lead by example. Now, I mean, some of the group executives are like me and pretty much always wear a tie. Others pretty much don't. And some are half and half. But yeah. I don't think it really matters. No, no. It's interesting. Some of the tech firms are so casual. You go to some insure techs and, yeah. uh, you know, they don't know you're in, in a suit and tie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. And, and so, you know, for us, trying to represent them in the market and stuff, you know, yeah. you're yeah. interested. So you, you have to, I, again, when in Rome, do what Rome does. Yeah. We used to yeah. do that at Catlin, you know, say in Singapore, you never wore a jacket unless you went to the regulator, you did wear a tie. Right. Increasingly in the States, other than New York, actually, I think in New York now, you probably want 50% wear ties and 50% yeah. don't. And that never, it always used to be like ties, like yeah. in London. Um, in Bermuda, well, just about anything goes there. <laughs> and in Europe, often you didn't wear a tie. It just, it does. But I'll, when we had all the offices, I used to work out how they dressed. Yeah. And then we dress accordingly. Like dress, yeah, yeah. What do you think the, like, what's your outlook for this year? We're out of Europe now. We've got a majority conservative government. Obviously, all the, the kind of, uh, the the, uh, the challenges with Lloyds and, and all of that stuff. How do you think this year will pan out? Where, where we are. We think about that and we think about convicts and then try to bring the two together inevitably. Yeah. Um, we had a much better start than we thought we were going to have, which is nice, which means that we're on track, we're ahead of, ahead of being on track. I don't think these outside events are going to affect that, so that's a relief. Bigger picture, um, I think there are a number of concerns that are out there which affect convicts and affect the whole insurance industry. Um, the world is not as stable as it has been. You know, I think anybody with the right with their brain in their head, it's going to be worrying about the relationship between China and States. Somebody just, somebody just said to me, described to me yesterday at breakfast, you know, the ex-MP actually said, well, of course, Russia is a parish council with a bomb. <laughs> but, 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 bomb capability. Brilliant. But you've obviously got, there's still a lot of disruption in the, in the Middle East, yeah. uh, which is not good. I wonder if we're walking towards another banking crisis. Um, I don't think it will be... I think banks are better capitalised than they were. But some of the old practices are coming back in again, you know, the concept yeah. of subprime is back. You think, hang on a bit. Couldn't people learn from that? So yeah. I don't know how stable that situation is. Brexit is, as I was saying, the breakfast as MP, as I don't. Honestly, Brexit is more of an issue for the government than it is for the city, because the city can cope with it. 
But what you need to understand is if coping for we, m- most people have got global businesses yeah. in some shape or form. So if you have to move part of your business over to Europe, okay, so be it. Yeah. Where government should worry about this is if the heart of a business starts moving away from the city, whether it be insurance, whether it be a bank, whatever it is, then there is some significant impact to yeah. UK Limited. City, whether you like it or not, is 25% of the GDP of the country, and insurance is about 25% of that 25%. So it's a, it's a chunk of change. Yeah. And I think the 10-year outlook is something that we should all worry about. And look around the city, and all these new cottages going up. We're in massive new, amount of new we're buildings. We're in the run. You yeah. And you think, well, you know, if are they full or hmm? are they full these new buildings? Well, ours is just about, yeah. but it's in prime location, so yeah. it went. If you're if you're looking for subprime location or you're looking at older buildings, they are struggling. Right. Um, if they're not eco-friendly, they struggle. <laughs> but you, you can see a situation potentially where the, if the workforce in the city drops by Brexit by fifteen percent, if it drops because of the technology by another, what should we say? 25 to 50 Well, they say more jobs will be created from technology, but... I'm not sure I buy it. We'll see. I'm not in the city at any rate. So, I mean, you could see the city's property market and retail market going into deep recession if we're not careful. I mean, there's there's a lot to do with Brexit yet, um, and we'll have to see what Boris Johnson does as opposed to what he says he's going to do. I also think it's going to take a lot longer than people think. I mean, the amount of legislation that has to be changed is mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, and it'll, it'll still be on years from today, actually, just because of the quantum of it. There's a risk that the um, Europe uses um, the city as a pawn in the negotiation. Why wouldn't they? At 25% of GDP. So it may be that we get in the next sooner than other people do and get more affected by Brexit. I think corporately we can work our way around it. I just worry about UK Limited. Yeah. I always have done. In, in, it, it, there's always going to be a. Um, a short-term economic consequence of what's happened. Yeah. Um, now, the train left the station some time ago. Uh, we, we, we need to go and do what we need to do. And there's been no point, in my view, going backwards. Yeah. That's history. We are now in post-Brexit mode, and we've got to deal with it accordingly. Uh, it's going to be something we've talked about for the next five years, at least. Also, feels a lot. A lot of this thing. A lot of this is sentiment as well. Yeah. You know, if, if, a lot of people I speak to, uh, people who aren't from the UK, love living in, certainly in London, yeah. when, I, when I go around the city. Yeah, yeah. They want to stay here. It's the most diverse city that I've been to in the world. I mean, you can be from anywhere, be anything, and, you know, live and work um, well. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's quite sticky, you know. like it's. And it's I, I, you make a very good point, actually, because you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter from whatever other country, if they, people have a choice of city, if, which does you should choose to live in, 95% of people would say London, Yeah. in the round. Um, and look, we're very lucky over here because we, we're the only country that speaks the, the common language of the world. We have a, a good legal system. Our regulatory system is tough and cumbersome, but it works by and large. You can speak to every time zone in the world in your working day. Yeah. And we are blessed with a lot of advantages in London, um, plus its history. I think this is, you're raising an interesting point because it's, I can't see Paris, Frankfurt, or Munich, or Frank, any of these places taking over. Nobody, nobody wants to live there. No. Because, and their populations are tiny, you know, three or four million. Obviously, Paris is a lot bigger. There's a lot. Go on. It's going to be. It's going to get unpleasant again. I suspect in terms of negotiations. Yeah. Um, but bottom line, it is actually Europe needs us just as much as we need them. It's yeah. not to anybody's advantage to to fall out. The separation of controlling your own destiny is what's happened. Now yeah. we have to find a way of working yeah. through it. And you know, everyone. The, the best negotiations are when everyone wins. Yeah. So hopefully we do that, and hopefully the government puts some good policies in place yeah. that we can. Yeah. There's a lot to play for. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Great to speak to you. Appreciate you coming in. And good luck with uh, building another business. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Enjoy it. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Mm